helping others or helping maintain property. Some are called to ministries to help oversee the finances of the church. Paul goes into this list of ministries. It's not an exhaustive list, but it is an exemplary list. It is a, a, not exemplary in the sense of these are the best ones, but it's a list of, of examples of ministries to which we are called. And I always like to remind congregations that one of the uh, gifts is for pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, not to be paid to do the ministry on our behalf, but to equip the church, the saints, you, the members, to do the ministry. I don't know if this is correct or not. It may happen everywhere. And I've almost always lived in the South, except for those two and a half years in Kansas and a few years I spent in Texas. Grew up in Arkansas, lived in Georgia and North Carolina. One of the things that I think is characteristic of the part of the country I've lived in and that my identity is in and I understand who I am in in the South is that when there's a job that we can't do or don't want to do, we hire somebody else to do it. And we usually hire somebody else to do it as cheap as we can pay them. And that sometimes, I think, carries over into our thinking in the church. But that's not the role of pastor and teacher. The role of pastor and teacher is to be called by you, the church, to equip you, to enable you, to give you the tools to do the ministry of the church. That, I believe, is an incredibly important calling. And the congregations that, from my perspective, which may be flawed, that I see to be is spiritually the strongest, have the strongest and boldest ministries, are the one where the membership, the laity, are the ones who, who carry out and do the ministry and are equipped by the clergy, the pastor, to do those particular ministries. But sometimes I think we simply say, is what we're doing relevant? And I think a bottom line is, a bottom line question is, is love relevant in the life of the church? There's so many things we love. And that word is used awfully flippantly at times. You know, I love bass region loafers because they're easy to get on and off. And I've always worn them. Have them on today. Have a black pair and a Corvin pair. Probably wear them 90% of the time I wear shoes. But it has nothing to do with the love that Paul is talking about. But the way we use words influences the way we use words in other contexts. And so love becomes sometimes a superficial word. Talk about shoes. And Paul is talking about the very foundation of our life together as the body of Christ. Love one another. And we love one another to build up the body of Christ in love. Is it relevant? Is it important? My older daughter, Julie, who's 33 years old, uh, when she, almost 10 years ago, she was in between her second and third year of seminary. She was serving as a chaplain intern at Crawford Long Hospital in downtown Atlanta, uh, a hospital that serves some of the hardened street people and some of the most wealthy and powerful citizens of Atlanta. She was still getting accustomed to being called Chaplain Richardson. She really didn't know who that was when that term was used for a while. And she was still trying to figure out how to work the pager that she had to wear on when she was on call, she got a page to come to the emergency room. She got to the emergency room and she saw coming out the door of one of the exam rooms this African-American young man, probably six to eight inches taller than she was. And she really didn't know what to do except to say, can I help you? Is there something wrong? And she said it was obvious that there was something wrong. He had blood on his shirt. And the man said, choking back tears, my grandfather, he's in there. He fell. He's bad. 
Later that same day, Julie went back to the emergency room, and the man was still there. His name was Nathaniel. Nathaniel's extended family had gathered by that time. And Julie said that coming up, it was, it was a bit intimidating to her to be gathered with this family who obviously believed firmly in the power of prayer and expressing that prayer in, in a most demonstrative way in the, in the hospital. And so she says, coming, having grown up in a rather subdued disciples' congregation where her dad was the pastor, uh, it was a bit intimidating. She continued to see this fam- fam- members of this family over the next several weeks in the ho- as they visited their grandfather in the hospital. Nathaniel had ample brain activity from the tests that were being run, but he just had not regained consciousness. And so Julie would go to his room, and she said, you know, I, I really didn't know what to do. Didn't know if it was better just to stand by his bedside and pray silently for him or to stand by his bedside and have a one-way conversation because he was not conscious. But I knew he was alive. He, she heard one of his daughters say one time how much he loved church music. And so one day, she pulled a chair up to the side of his bed, reached over and held his hand, and she began singing Amazing Grace. Just her and Nathaniel unconscious in the room. She saw the corner of her eye, another person in a moment, as she sang, and realized it was Nathaniel's doctor. He was staying there in his lab coat and his clipboard. And Julie said, I was very embarrassed and said, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and leave the room. And the doctor said, no, no. What you are doing is, in, as, is as important as what I am doing. That the shape for ministry. I believe that when Paul said to the Ephesians, build one another up in love because you are the body of Christ, is as important today as it was 2,000 years ago. And my sisters and brothers in Christ, we live in a culture that does not appreciate that. In our culture today, outside the church, and oftentimes from my observation inside the church, we live with this notion, you either agree with me or we're leaving, or you have to leave. We can't do this together. That's what our politicians say. That's what many of our, our social activists say. And that's what I have seen churches say. The Presbyterians, you may have seen on the on, on the news, gathered this weekend in Charlotte. And they're voting on a very difficult issue in the life of the church. And Sam Robertson, the, pres- the executive presbytery in the Charlotte Presbytery, he said, you know, I think that we can all live together with whatever decision it is, but I don't think all my church people think that. It's a struggle to love. It's a struggle to honor each other's ministries. It is a struggle to be one body because we are all different. And we have different gifts. And we have been... Uh, practiced in our gifts in different ways in various places in the community. We have lived in different places. We have come here. We've had different experiences in life. And yet, here, Christ says, we are one. Whatever you do, we are one as church. And as hard as that can be at times, my friends, that is the good news of the gospel. 